Hey everyone, welcome to the AC Podcast. This is Andy Steiger, and I am joined today by my good friend, David Drisdale. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm so honored to be here. It is great to have you with us. Uh, David has an, uh, an interesting story that I'm looking forward to getting into today. But before we do, uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? How long have you been a pastor, first of all? Right. So I have been the most honored, privileged pastor of a, a multicultural church called Pentap for approximately 20 years. And we started out in Burnaby and we're now in the city of Surrey. 20 years. Yeah. Now you've got an accent. You're, you are originally from Jamaica? Yes. The tiny island of Jamaica Usain Bolt's country, Bob Marley's country. Yeah, that's where we're rolling So, so from. can you run really fast and are you a great singer? Neither. <laughs> that's why I am a pastor. That's why I'm a pastor. Now, uh, you, uh, you've been living in uh, Canada the entire time? Yes. So uh, in, in BC in particular for oh, approximately 25 years, uh, we have four children and um, our eldest is uh, almost 24 and then our youngest is almost 14. So that's the span. So we've been here for a quarter of a century. I want to jump into, uh, into your story, which uh, has a number of twists and turns that I find really fascinating and uh, very unique. So when you began as a pastor, you began in a denomination or a church that is very different from the denomination or church that you're in today. And I, I guess I'm, I'm hesitant to even use the word uh, denomination because you, we would say that, that where you started was not within an ortho, orthodox church. Yeah, so... You know, I grew up in the church in Jamaica from I was uh, seven years old, was baptized when I was 10 years old, and um, thought that I was a part of the best church and thought that the church as a part of that every church was like that. And, um, you know, went through the whole process, even in British Columbia, of becoming a minister in the same organization. And um, but once I started to pastor, that's when everything hit the fan, so to speak. OK, so you're saying then it, growing up in Jamaica, uh, you grew up in a church that you just kind of figured, OK, this is this, this is the church that everybody is a part of. Now, what what church were you a part of? Yeah, so it's it's a Pentecostal church. Um, the group is called United Pentecost. The organization is called United Pentecostal uh, International. And um, I assume that every Pentecostal church had the same doctrinal and cultural practices and beliefs. So I think this is going to surprise a lot of people that when it comes to doctrine, not all Pentecostals hold to the same doctrine, particularly when it comes to the nature of God. Yes, yes, yes. And in fact, um, in Jamaica, Jamaica, I guess it has something to do with the missionaries who came there, but Jamaica has a certain slant, which is actually the minority when I came here to Canada, which is quite interesting for me. So uh, what, what is this, uh, the, the church? What, what's like, what's What's the overarching umbrella of what it's referred to or called? Yeah, so um, we're the group that I'm from is called Oneness Pentecostal uh, Pentecostalism, which is a version of modalism for those Bible scholars who, <laughs> uh, and we'll get into some of these definition in a bit here. But uh, the classical Pentecostal would be what we call Trinitarian Pentecostalism, and uh, the group we're from is more oneness. And uh, in fact, I would say most Jamaicans, if if they're Pentecostal, probably eighty percent would be would be classified as oneness as opposed to Trinitarian. Okay, that's interesting. Interesting. I, I didn't realize that this is very common in Jamaica yeah. within the Pentecostal uh, uh, church. So just for clarity, for those of you listening to us, so, um, so David grew up in a oneness Pentecostal church that would uh, not hold to a Trinitarian view uh, of God. Right. So 
what, you know, growing up in, in, in that church, what did you think of or what were you told about, you know, these other churches and yeah. their view of the Trinity? And in a nutshell, the image is that, you know, we're called oneness because we believe in one God. And so the, the concept is that a Trinity or an actual belief in three gods, that's kind of how it's sold to us over the years. And it actually took me quite a while to understand it differently because this is such a big thing that we would not even entertain basic dialogue or um, entertain any kind of ministerial um, uh, you know, exposure to a Trinitarian because as far as we're concerned, that's crazy false doctrine. I've noticed that this team seems to be fairly universal actually with the oneness view is that baptism tends to go hand in hand with that view. Can you yes. tease that out for for listeners like what the uniqueness of baptism within that? For a oneness person, Jesus is the essence of God in every sense. So Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. The name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Son is Jesus, the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. So when it's time for baptism, in uh, following the prescription of Matthew 28, 19, go baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For a oneness person, the emphasis is on that one word, the name. And so as far as they're concerned, you need to identify this mysterious name, the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit. And so you need to invoke the name Jesus for you to be able to um, have your baptism have any effect. So in other words, to, like if you want to get to heaven, you must be baptized, oh, yeah. and it must be a correctly done baptism. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's no way of getting into heaven unless you're baptized with the preacher invoking the act, the specific word in Jesus or phrase in Jesus' name. Now, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but let me just ask you know what what are some common um, you know uh, objections or common uh, responses, because I can think of an immediate objection, for example, like uh, when Jesus is talking to the thief on the cross, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Clearly, he didn't get baptized. Uh, how do they deal with a passage like that? Yeah, you know, all of the passages in the Bible, whether, you know, you're at John 4 with Jesus talking with the woman at the well or going all the way to his crucifixion and the, the thieves on the cross. You, as far as a oneness person is concerned, these are all situational and they're all pre-New Testament. So they're almost inter-testaments. You know, we're still, we're not in the Old Testament, but we're not quite in the New Testament because as far as a oneness person is concerned, the New Testament really starts with Acts chapter two uh, on the day of Pentecost. Okay, so that's kind of, they kind of see that as like ground zero. So, ground zero. So any, anything pre that, they just yeah. see kind of as a one-off. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's uh, right. Now, one of the things I th think is interesting about this is we've talked over the years and I've, I've thought about this, and that is it's a, it's a very works-based yeah. view of your relationship with God. It's, yeah. it's not so much that you have a relationship with God in that sense, but that you've done things in the right way yeah. to make God happy sort of idea. Am I, am yeah, I wrong there? No, you're not wrong. Um, how it has been sold to us as we grew up is that the first thing is that you need to love truth, you know. And uh, unless you understand and subscribe to Acts 2.38, you are not walking in truth. So then uh, from, from ground zero, if you don't do that as far as they're concerned, you know, Anything else does not make sense. So uh, it's it's not so much a works in their mind. It's more their attempt to to be truth lovers. So from their angle, they would say, no, this is about our fidelity to truth. Yes, an obedience to the word of God. But it is interesting, though, that you've got to do things in a specific way yeah. to, you know, 
to meet God happy or to get entrance to yeah. uh, eternal life sort of idea. Yeah, and it's, it actually goes further. And um, funny enough, I've been in a church from when I was a boy, and it's actually not until I became a pastor that I actually truly understood that not only were they saying that you need to f- be obedient to some specific words, but they have uh, a, a reason for that. So, for example, when it comes to baptism, the oneness group, for the most part, uh, subscribed to the philosophy that your sins cannot be forgiven unless you use those words. So your sins are not forgiven when you confess Christ or when you repent. Your sins are only forgiven once the water comes and washes away your sins. And and so that's where it becomes really a doctrinal um, heaven and hell point of view. And and I think that's a good point of clarification. So it's not that it's, you got to do things in a certain order with regards to evoking Jesus' name, but that you need to have your your sins forgiven, of course, but you can only get your sins forgiven by being baptized using Jesus' name in a certain way. Yes, and so because of that theology, you can understand then that when it comes to fellowshipping with any group that does not uh, subscribe to this philosophy, is 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 considered compromise, and so uh, a trinitarian is still in their sins. So you know we can love them from a distance, but in terms of true fellowship and ministerial exchange, that's just not allowed because um, the sin part has not been addressed as far as a oneness person is concerned. Now let's. Uh... Let, let, let me ask a couple qu- quick questions too, as we start to get a little deeper into your story. Yeah. Let's, so we talked about baptism. Let's switch gears and talk about Trinitarianism. What do uh, oneness uh, Pentecostals or just anybody who holds to oneness theology? You know, how how are they viewing those passages that? Uh, make this distinction between the Father and between the Son and the yeah. Holy Spirit. And you even see this particularly in places like Matthew uh, 28, 19, of course, which is, a, I'm sure that's a verse they struggle with quite a bit, yeah. where Jesus, you know, in, uh, invokes that you are to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so how one is gets around all of this is to say that embodied within Jesus is this duality. So there's the man and then there's deity. But as far as deity is concerned, the deity part is God, not just the son of God. So there's a humanity of Jesus and then there's the God part of Jesus. And so um, when Jesus was being baptized, for example, and then, you know, there's that voice that came down from heaven and, you know, that image of the dove and saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. For a oneness person, that's just the humanity of God having a conversation with the spirituality or, or the spirit version of God is, is how it, it's explained. So when did you start to encounter uh, Trinitarian theology? And let's, let's talk about you know, your story of when you're encountering that and what ultimately led to you leaving oneness theology. Yeah, so, you know, in some ways, you know, as I tell my story, I feel embarrassed in some ways. I mean, I went to university, and so I I think I'm a fairly intellectual person, but I was so close-minded growing up in Jamaica as it relates to anything to do with the Trinity, Uh, and I guess it's just the way it was um, taught to me from a very early age. So uh, the responsibility to go and um, read for myself or research for myself you, I just kind of took um, my leaders and my teachers' words for it. And um, when the Lord, when I felt that pull towards the ministry, uh, I did not do, and again, I feel almost embarrassed to say this, but did not do the kind of work that I think I should have done to really understand, you know, the, the broader part of Christianity. By that, do you mean like even just the history of Christianity? That's right. So, and I mean, funny enough, I taught um, church history, but again, you can find enough books out there that takes you down a particular path. And so, you know, I, I did my research and, and 
thought that I was doing fairly well in terms of um, you know having a good base for for my doctrinal belief but it was after starting to pastor and then having to answer questions of people you know and realizing that some of the the things that I've been rehearsing over the years that after a while I'm not so sure I believe them and that sent me well that opened my heart to to at least being inquisitive I could only imagine as a pastor that's starting to question your theology and you're, you're, you know, going to start exploring this and you've encountered this other pastor that's, you know, that's also helped, you know, you down this path. That's got to be scary. Oh, and again, I was so naive because I assumed that the people that I was leading, especially some of the ministers that were a part of our group, I assumed that they were just as blind and as just ignorant as me. And so if I come to them with this great revelation that they were going to just all eat it up and say, my, I, I just never saw it like that. But boy, the moment I touched certain things, all hell broke loose. Now, this is an interesting part of your story. Yeah. We've, we've all, I'm sure, heard of different stories where somebody's, you know, had a, a cha- they, they've been challenged by a certain theology that they've held on to. And... Your story is unique, though, in that you're not only questioning this theology and going down that exploration of, hey, should we hold to this? What, you know, what is correct theology? Uh, what, what is the Bible teaching? You did this with your congregation. You said, let's go, let's, let's explore this together. Yeah, because I, I didn't trust myself at this point. And moreover, I, I just felt like I needed other people to give me their take. So we, we decided to just turn our Sunday services into a, uh, an exploration and just started down this path to question everything, to question baptism, to question the Godhead, to question um, cultural practices, what we call church standards, to question it all. And so uh, we, we I, I was naive, actually, because I, I thought it would be an exciting experience for the entire <laughs> church. And uh, boy, did we ever pay for that. It, it was exciting, but maybe not in the fun way. Oh, no, it's um, it, it was it was disruptive and it it cost us. We we lost pretty much over, I'd say, four or five years. We lost 90 percent of our congregation. God has been good to us. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of new people. In fact, our congregation is is larger right now than when we started the process. But it's uh, we we definitely did not keep most of the, the ones who started with us. Given what you just said there, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, what what do you think it would be? Um, I would have done things a whole lot different. Um, I think I think I did not help to bring people along with me because there's a there was a lot of disappointment on my part that I was in this group that had kept us blinded and restricted and all of that. So I'm sure a lot of my tone expressed a lot of disappointment and probably so you had some frustration. I had frustration and maybe anger even in my delivery. And I think I think also that might have contributed to some saying I, I you know this is just too much for me. So I think I would have tried it a different way. Um and uh, I'm not so sure I would have done it again using the Sunday service. You know, I think I'd probably try and get a team together who wanted to go on the journey and then um, uh, probably discuss it more in the midweek Bible studies. That's what I'm thinking, but then I, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, it is interesting. I, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but in my in my time in seminary, I took a church on, uh, I took a class on church history uh-huh. and we studied Martin Luther. And I remember uh, having gone through that, and then, of course, I'm, I'm off pastoring, but one day I encountered somebody that's telling me about how, you know, was, was asking me about Martin Luther's anti-Semitic, you know, comments and, mm-hmm. and asking me questions about it, and I was completely ignorant, mm-hmm. you know, to it. And, and I remember being pretty angry mm-hmm. myself, mm-hmm. Uh, and I went back to, to that seminary, went back to my prof, and I was just like, Hey, like you didn't give me the whole story. Yeah. You really did me a disservice by, you know, sugarcoating Martin Luther and and uh, you know, leaving out certain aspects of of uh, the history that's important. Mm. And 
And I could, so I could appreciate what mm. for you, I'm sure it felt very similar where you're like, Hey, you've, you've sugarcoated a certain type of doctrine and you've yeah. left out all this other, yeah. you know, doctrine and, uh, and I'm frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, our family, we have three daughters, for example, and something as simple as a lady wearing, um, you know, a, a pair of pants or uh, wearing jewelry, it was a no-no with the group. So these are some extra stuff now to the, that is I also tacked on. I think on. that's an interesting point, though, because okay, we're already looking at, okay, this doctrine is pretty legalistic. That's right, that's right. Well, it shouldn't surprise you then right. that legalism then the is... Fruits, yeah, yeah, the fruits. Yeah, the fruit of it is... That's strong. right. They go hand in hand, right? It's, um, it, yeah, and so th there's some extra stuff as well that is, and it's it's predominantly heavy-handed for the ladies, you know, and so here I was trying to be honorable to those who have taught me well, and then I'm trying to pass this along to my kids and putting my kids under undue pressure as if they don't have enough to deal with already just to be a Christian at school and so it, it, it made me frustrated and this this was even true of yourself though because I remember one time you were at an event we were at an event together and you were wearing shorts oh, yeah. and you still felt uncomfortable oh, wearing 100%. shorts and, <laughs> and I grew up I used to play a lot of football soccer for North Americans and so shorts is something I grew up with but then became very conscious because of the the group we were in so yeah now that I'm thinking about your question as to, you know, what would I have done differently, I think I'd probably still go take the Sunday approach, but I think I'd be probably more, more patient with those who, uh, you know, weren't there where I think, I believe God was taking me. I, I, I'm amazed at just your bravery and your willingness to be faithful to God's word, because I mean, some pastors would just be like, "Hey, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna resign. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna head out. I'm gonna go figure out my own way and and part ways." But y you didn't do that, you know, and you wanted to bring your congregation along with you. Tell me about that. Like, what, what, what was your, you know, drive to to do that and to not just part ways and go? Oh, I'm gonna go figure things out and figure out what I'm gonna do with my life from there. Not as brave as I'd like to <laughs> let you think, Andy. Uh, in fact, um, I, I contemplated resigning. In fact, I um, discussed it with my senior team and pastors, and uh, we were actually going to resign and just pack it in because I, I started to feel I was um, starting to touch some things that I felt was going to take me down a path that uh, was different. I, I didn't know where I was heading, but I, I, I realized that a lot of what I was doing was wrong. This is an interesting point, mm -hmm. just for clarity. So you're saying, uh, listen, remember this story is in progress. I didn't That's know right. where I was going to end That's up. That's right. That's but right. you just knew that I what that you needed where, to change. I, I knew where I was I gotcha. was wrong. But I didn't know how to get there, and I didn't know who would come with me. So the first point was, you know what, before I start to ruffle this thing, let's get out of this thing, go back to my other job. I, I used to be in IT and banking, so I'm like, you know, I'll go back to do that, and then I'm not ruffling any feathers. But um, it, it just didn't work for me to resign, but I... I really explore that idea, you know. So was your senior leadership team, were they with you to... I would say my senior leadership team wasn't, um, wasn't, yeah. I would say some of my mid-tier was, but the senior leadership team were, a lot of them were people who were coming from other churches that were part of the same organization that kind of ended up in our church. And so but those folks, they had already made a decision years ago that that's not a path that they would go down. So, yeah, that became a quite a place of resistance. I could only imagine the kind of pressure you felt. We just constantly in prayer, a lot of second guessing. I'm, I'm, or did you feel confident as you kept walking no, down this no, path? No, no, no confidence. No confidence. <laughs> no confidence. No confidence. You know, now looking back, I promise you, there's a lot of things that I'm, you know, I'll, I'm grateful for. But, for example, there was one weekend that... Um, 
uh, after I, you know, I I'd done some preaching and I was I was really heavy. In fact, I wore the same black suit for a month and I told the church I was in mourning. And I'm like, how we have done church, this is not a right. You know, we have secluded ourselves. We have, we have, we, we should have fellowship with a whole lot of people and we haven't. And I was in mourning. And um, unfortunately, I, that sermon was recorded and, and there's an orchestration. And one weekend I came to church and one third of our church, our leadership team had gone and leadership team, leadership core members. So one third of our finances, one third of, one third of everything dropped off one weekend. And that's when it hit the fan. And, uh, and I tell you the next month I lost about 20 pounds in, in a, in a month's time because all of a sudden my name was out there, but for all the wrong reasons. And that was a very uncomfortable time for me. Oh, I, I can't even imagine how how stressful that that must have been. What what got you through that time? Um, you know the grace of God. <laughs> so the initial shock, the initial folks went. Then I found the next three four years was a time of me trying to feel my way around, trying to understand the scriptures. And uh, part of my challenge, I think it took me longer than others because you need to understand I'm coming out of oneness, but I still didn't trust Trinitarians. So I am not going over there for any kind of help or exposure. I, I'm not reading their books. I, I don't want them to speak too much into my life. I'm, you know, I'm checking out uh, this one Trinity here in Pastor's Church, but I'm going under the radar. I'm slipping in and slipping out, and I don't want him to call me. And so it's, um, it, 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 it was a longer per, uh, process because of the distrust. And during that time as well, some of the others who had kind of stayed with us and liked me as a person and like the general mission of the church they did their best to stay but almost every week another family left so it was this drip feed you know drip 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 of losing another family every single week and oh for about three four years one thing that I've noticed with, you know, I've talked with people that have made such a big transition, particularly, you know, often when people come out of a cult or something like that, mm. they are a- a- angry and they just, they just, they'll just run kind of idea and they, they just, they kind of lose themselves in many ways. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting with you that, you know, you are, you, it, you still have that desire to seek out truth. You, I'm, I'm sure there was some anger there, mm. but why didn't you run away from the church? Why didn't you run, run away from God? Yeah, that's one Andy I'm grateful for. I, I'm grateful that the Lord helped me not to become bitter because um, our church, when we began, we built our church with a core team, but a lot of the core team was also my family members. You know, my core family, our church, you know, family came from Jamaica to help us as well. And unfortunately, a lot of my personal family members, you know, thought that I... I've lost it. Let me just ask you quickly mm-hmm. as you keep it. So is, did you come from Jamaica to plant a church? Okay. So that's a very interesting question. I, um, uh, yes and no. Um, I came to BC on the invitation of another pastor to be involved in ministry somehow. And, um, you know, I used to be a banker, so I was able to support my family and all of that. And uh, so we supported another church for about four, f- four or five years. But then I increasingly felt the urge to start this church. So that's when we went back to Jamaica and encouraged our family to come, our immediate family, like our parents, um, brothers, sisters, their spouses, to come and help us to start this church. So, so um, our immediate family came up for us to start this church together. So then you've got a lot of family in your church and now you're making this transition, you're heading, you're exploring down this path of, a, of, of theology. I'm, I'm guessing <laughs> that the family component yeah. was, was challenging. Yeah, because, you know, the family, they felt betrayed as well because we all grew up in the same church in Jamaica. Okay. And so now I am, and I asked them to come and help me to plant a church like the church in Jamaica. In fact, the name of our church in BC is, um, the same name as the church that I grew up in in Jamaica. So that's where we even got the name. And 
Mm -hmm. We haven't changed that name yet. Although we have changed so many other things, we haven't changed the name. So I think my family also struggle with, you know, feeling a sense of betrayal on my part. Probably thinking, you know, he, he think he's so smart and all of that. And now he's changing all the things that we grew up with. So that was difficult, I think, for my extended family as well. Tell me uh, a little bit about what it was theologically and what you were exploring that ultimately led you to, to where you landed and, and then where did you land? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I think once I started to be more exposed to Trinitarian people in general and starting to see the humility, the selflessness, just the, the Christ-likeness. The, fr the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. I, I could not get away from, but that's a true Christian. And so, you know, I started to work backwards to say, I, I don't know about this, all this doctrinal stuff and what we should believe, but I know that's a Christian. And I, I remember saying to one of my senior pastors in the group that I was a part of that, of a particular pastor that when I go to heaven, I don't want to even be standing beside that particular person because I don't feel, I feel like my life is just so subservient to, to that person who I have seen, I've been trying to emulate Christ. Are you saying that you just don't feel adequate to even be around that other person? Well, okay. when I've seen their fruit, I'm like, I don't want to stand up beside this person in heaven because I know that they have, they have a walk with God that I can just pray and, and dream to ever attain. So I think their walk with God be, spoke louder to me that I may not understand all the doctrinal pieces, but I, the end result, I'm like, but I want something more like that. I want more like that. And so I kind of worked backwards. I kind of started yeah. to work backwards. I'm, I'm starting to realize that more and more. It's kind of yeah. like you, it's like you saw the fruit. Yeah. And now you wanted to know what kind of tree is that? That's right. What's producing this That's kind of fruit? That's right. That's right. That's right. And so, yeah. And so where we landed, we, we just landed to the point. We just went right to Romans. And if you believe and confess that Jesus is, uh, you know, Christ and, you know, and believe in your heart, you know, I just, it, and it's true belief, not just a word, not just some words, but truly believe in your heart. That to me is my baseline. That's my baseline. Not, not some works of how I'm baptized, what some... Well, funny enough, the, the thing about baptism is, is funny because I've spent some time really going into the baptism in part. And it's actually funny that here, this is about my salvation, but then the onus on baptism is about what somebody who is baptizing me says on me. That doesn't even make sense. It's, mm. it's the person who is coming to Christ that should audibly confess Christ, you know, and, and so it's not so much what someone says over me. It, it's what I say, you know, and more importantly, what the Lord says once I accept him. One of the things I just see is so clear there is ultimately what you're saying is relationship yeah. is key. My relationship with God, yeah. not the words that somebody's saying over me yeah. being key. And then within my relationship with God, that, that the, you see the fruit then that develops from the type of relationship I have, which is a relationship of forgiveness and grace and, and, yeah. and what that produces. Yeah. Would, and, uh, would as you, you agree with that? A hundred percent. In fact, uh, you know, for oneness person, we struggle with why do we need to have oneness People love the word manifestation. So Second Timothy 3.16, you know, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So one is people love to use the word manifest, manifestation, you know, that God, that same God manifests as Father, manifests as Son, manifests as Holy Spirit. And one is people run, run away from the word distinctiveness, you know, because the, the concept of being distinctive, you know, alludes to there must be uniqueness and then that's where one is people are afraid that you're calling the waters with is it really one or is it three but funny enough the distinctiveness between the father and the son is very important for us to really have an image of relationship 
before we can understand how God so loved the world, we really need to understand how the Father so loved the Son. <laughs> because that relationship is what we are going to use as a model to know how to have a, a proper relationship with each other. It is such an important point because I remember, you know, maybe this is kind of unique for you in that when I first started coming to church, and I was introduced to Trinitarian doctrine, I remember thinking, wow, this is so complicated. Why, why are we holding this? And, you know, and you start to question it from, from that perspective. But now I, I, I have a very different perspective because I, I do think that there's Christians out there, Trinitarian Christians, that are, they kind of have this view of the, of the Trinity, like it's this this difficult to explain belief that we have that we're not sure why we have it. I think some people hold to that, kind of have that mm -hmm. view. Mm -hmm. Now I have the view that I'm so incredibly thankful for this theology, for this doctrine, because it makes sense of things that I can't make sense of any other way yeah. that are absolutely essential to the nature of God, yeah. such as First John telling us that God is love. Yeah. Well, how are you going to have a God whose essence is love or whose essence is goodness unless that uh, unless God, you know, embodies that within his nature. How, how does God embody love yeah. if God's only one, right? Yeah. Whereas if God is three, yeah. then you have the nature of community, of right. uh, family within the essence of who God is. Yeah. And now, like what you're saying now, right relationship or goodness uh, is being modeled within God. It's again, it's part of God's nature mm -hmm. that God is good or that we know what right relationship is actually is you know we've been made in the image of god yes which is a which is a relational image yes and it shouldn't surprise us then that we've been made for a relational purpose yes. and that we live within community we yeah. have a family yeah you know that this is absolutely essential to who we are as persons and and man that i would like that leads down a whole nother you know theological rabbit trail of of important doctrine though mm -hmm. that is interesting in that you know, you can start to ask, well, what's the fruit then? What's the fruit of embracing a relational nature of God and a relational nature of, you know, of, of even our essence in what we've been, in the purpose that we've been created for and what's ultimately going to lead to our flourishing and our good right. and what that relationship is to look like. Yeah. As, as we close here, sure. uh, I wanted to just ask, you know, one, one question that I, I haven't asked you yet is, is as that whole journey is taking place, I'm guessing that your wife, you know, in your, your fam, your immediate family was probably core to, you know, you keeping your sanity and all yeah. that, but you know, how, how did your wife react and how did she interact with you? Cause I'm sure there was tension. You know, I'm what we call a first generation Pentecostal, meaning that my family came in together, but in the case of my wife, her parents or grandparents she has a history of this thing so funny of even my wife as far as she's concerned is boy he has gone off the deep end so it took her a while as well you know I think a big thing for my wife as well has been the dress code right you know my wife is fairly modest and and so you know I, and my wife is involved with the music ministry a lot so you know having a musician ladies on the platform in, in her pants that's sacrilegious but now we have a church where you see uh, folks wearing you know pants or ripped jeans and all these things and yet so when it's time for worship you people hit the floor and you see the tears and you see the genuine fruit and so uh, I think it has been a process for her as well but I think she's um, she's there now so uh. it is interesting uh, like how difficult it can be for people that have grown up particularly oh, yeah. within a very rigid yeah. rules-based yeah. system yeah. to to Im it's very difficult to embrace you know uh freedom once people are committed to a certain set of of, of, of thinking then other views, people are just not prepared to, to consider them because this has formed the basis of all their friendships and all their associations. You know, people will go through a whole lifetime never really exploring anything else because, you know, you got me before I was 10. With, with a lot of relational pressure, yeah. particularly you often see that with well, if you start heading in a different direction, then you're going to lose your, your community. Yeah. Which 
which you experienced to a, you yeah. know to a large degree. But I'm yeah. I'm I'm thankful to hear though that things are going yeah our things are going well. God has been good to us, and um, you know I think even some of our family members who who are um, not uh, necessarily you know agreeing with all of the changes we have made. I think though they have seen enough fruits to say, wow, you know, seem like. God is with them. So uh, I'm sure there will be uh, chapter two and chapter three <laughs> of this whole saga. But, you know, in, in closing, Andy, one thing I'd like to say is uh, one of the things that was a shocker for me is I thought my experience was so unique until I came out and I realized that there's so many people who have gone through this similar thing that I was losing sleep, man. And I, 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 I had lost appetite and I'm like, oh my Lord, they're killing me. And I felt like I, I was one of the prophet, the only prophet that was really being persecuted. Then I realized, oh boy, there's so many people who have been misunderstood for the gospel and, and yet still God has just blessed them. That's important to know, yeah. is particularly if somebody is, is watching, listening to this, maybe you've come out of, uh, or you're having questions within a movement that you're in. Um, you know, you're not alone. Yeah. And and there's others that have uh, gone through that before you. And it's it's good, I think, to have that community even yeah. to reach out, yeah. you know, to people that have had a similar experience. Yeah. And, and, you know, just want to encourage you to seek the Lord, seek truth. And if you if you need somebody, I'm sure Dave would make himself available to, yes. to connect with you or uh, with us here at Apologetics Canada. Well, thank you for listening to the AC Podcast. This is a ministry of Apologetics Canada. And we will come back next week with more things to think about. Until then, love God and love people. Thanks for joining us, David. Oh, what an honor. Thanks for having me. It's the AC Podcast. For the love of God, love people.